Hi, Ludwig. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, on this rainy morning in Glasgow. <laughs> so, we are here to talk about uh, EEL, or E-E-L. Um, two titles, one, one piece of theatre. Um, so, let us get the ball rolling, as it were. Um, I'm going to ask you how we as a group of three individual artists and devisers collaborated together to sort of um, find our way to what became eel and what was the journey of finding the content and the specific specifically of that okay well um i think what's important is that we all had something we're passionate about and that is reflected in the piece so um, Maggie was most interested in devising, if I remember correctly. So in the process as a whole, um, you brought an interest in the human brain and sort of thought processes and how, how they're influenced and how they're made, how we experience um, sensations. Um, so you brought that to the table. Um, I think that's the one that got minimized the most, but it's in there. It is in there. There was traces of it. <laughs> right. And um, I was really, um, one of my favorite books is The Sandman, which is a German novel. And it's actually about someone making an automaton, like back from the 1900s, making an automaton to infiltrate society. So that's an age old fear that people seem to have. And I, I find it fascinating that we still have that fear and it seems as contemporary as anything. Um, so I wanted that to be in there and it's definitely in there. And um, yeah, the concept of audience participation. So it was a very a form led process because we knew these are the things we want there to be in there. They helped us dictate the content a lot, which is the other way around than you'd normally do it. But I think proved very exciting for us. So, um, but I maybe invite you Katie to talk more about the devising process, how we came from all these ideas to an actual play. Yeah, well, I mean, from what I can remember, it was just lots and lots of conversations, <laughs> lots of going on walks in December um, and uh, just like brainstorming with each other, talking about what it was. I think it was quite important for us to move on from these ideas by digging down into what it was that specifically excited us about them and then pulling on those threads um, because they, they're all quite big topics. And so we had to really whittle down our focus and then try and sort of figure out how those whittled down topics could weave in with each other more. Um, but there was, you know, as is always the case with any devising process, there was a thousand ideas and one of them got through the sieve, <laughs> you know, um, which was, which was sometimes quite a shame in a way. I think there were some really great ideas that we had that just didn't end up making sense. And I think occasionally we hung on to them for longer than we should have done. <laughs> as well and then we're just like no okay somebody has to say this this is officially not working anymore <laughs> um but yeah I think it wasn't it was a very sort of collaborative way of working though which I enjoyed for sure um and then yeah we just sort of talked and talked and talked and then you uh very kindly sort of sat down and wrote the script and I know that you sort of say oh I just wrote what everyone I just typed up what we'd spoken about but there's a lot more to, <laughs> to that script than that <laughs> um but yeah then we when we had the script and we were sort of on our way and into rehearsals um which was a very strange experience but what how did you sort of find approaching rehearsals because it was a strange 
way of doing it where all three of us, you know, both you and I are on the directing course, Maggie's on the acting course, but all three of us were acting in it and collaborating. And there were scenes where all three of us were working at the same time. So maybe like, can you sort of talk a little bit about how we approached the, the actual rehearsal process of it? Yeah, I mean, Firstly, I think what really proved in our rehearsal process is people always get bang on about it, but it proved crucial to work on a basis of yes and. So, you know, the yes buts and the, the no's, um, they just could derail an entire day. Like being on Zoom has its challenges in terms of focus, but if someone then also, you know, forgets to yes and, um, that, that definitely like it's, very crucial that we stayed on track there um and we had an interesting three director model um, where we took turns so we'd take a chunk of text a couple of beats um of text and we'd we just decide to work on that now and then one of us would be the designated director even though they were in it and they'd basically just given the lines without doing a lot of acting so they just say their lines, however, and write down um, notes for the other two, give those notes. Then we'd run the same segment again with the second person being the director, the other two being fully in it. And then a third time, the third person, um, which was really good for line learning because we had two weeks to learn that entire thing, an hour's worth of content. Um, and it was certainly helpful that we reran segments so much um yeah i did find our pace remarkably quick i i definitely thought it's going to be slower uh we found ourselves with basically almost a week um just for running it um which was good because um as i remember there were lots of uh, technical challenges involved with zoom playing your own cues you know, whilst acting. Do you want to talk about how we approached that and what we faced there? Yeah, well, this is the thing. This is the sort of um, quirk, shall we say, of Zoom acting is that you have to be your own stage manager in the moment. Um, and there's that's, that's a challenge, but it can be really fun because it kind of adds another layer to what you bring to a piece when you're Zoom acting. Um, so from what I remember, like, yeah, as you say, we sort of, we raced through the script in terms of how quickly we sort of rehearsed it and bedded it in and made our decisions and worked on our characters. And, and as you say, that bought us the time that we needed because you do need to commit a lot of time, I think, to the... It, it, that technical aspect kind of becomes as much of a job for you in your acting as everything else. Um, there's the practicality of how do you look like you're not clicking your mouse and doing something funny with the settings whilst you're trying to sort of like say your line and speak. And, um, you know, our, we we did a sort of a, t a technical rehearsal, like a paper tech almost, didn't we? Where you had created this amazing cue sheet um, and we had something like, God, what was it? Something like 50 cues <laughs> overall. Um, and uh, we sort of divvied them up. And we also, it was interesting because it ended up sort of being what makes the most dramaturgical sense cue wise like who who which character does it make sense to give this cue to and that weirdly ended up helping me I can't speak for you or Maggie but you know it was my responsibility a lot of the time to launch the polls which is something that Dr McVeigh as the assistant to the training session would be in charge of so it kind of helped me stay in the moment and kept me sort of being like oh well this is a bit where I've got to launch those polls for Hargraves uh, sort of thing um, but yeah, we did have to take some time to very methodically work through it all. Um, and then it was things, it, it's funny things that you don't really ever think about in sort of stage acting or, or non-Zoom acting, where it was like, I had, you know, my 
book, my script with all of my cues written in it next to me on the side. And I had to think about, okay, well, I've got a cue on the next page. I know that. But if I'm talking right now, my microphone might hear me turning the page and then it gives away the fact that I've got a script in front of me and all of this is sort of not real. Um, so you have to think about, okay, well then I've got to wait until Maggie or Ludwig is speaking so that I can turn my page really subtly, but I also have to turn it in such a way that my shoulder doesn't do a thing <laughs> that goes like that and stuff like this, because the camera's right there. So you've got to be very sort of precise in your, uh, in your movements and stuff, which I found really uh, interesting. But yeah, I mean, what, what were your sort of, I'd sort of touched I, a little bit there on like the challenges of sort of framing yourself whilst you're acting on Zoom in a technical way, but what did you find um, different to stage acting or film acting that, that was specific to Zoom? Hmm. Um, I mean, I firmly believe it's still my job to react and be in the moment as an actor. I'm actually a director, but as an actor, I'd be try to be in the moment, feed off my partner, give them something back. Basically, my kind of acting. And um, it's just a question of directing my focus so I manage because I'm obviously, like everyone else, um, very distracted by my own image. Um, and you just have to train yourself to not look at yourself, but just feed off the information you can see and even feed off how it's framed what you can see. So just choose to just use whatever you can in order to just connect. And that is definitely very tiring, but, um, but rewarding when you actually feel that genuine connection without even being able to touch. Um, mm. So that, that was... Uh, it was very interesting um and of course not being a professional actor um remembering all the things was... <laughs> but you know that you know that Katie <laughs> <laughs> yeah I feel your pain I you know it was interesting one of the like one of the things that I found hardest to to do actually was stay in character sometimes because I'd be sat at my desk and I'd be looking at you or Maggie and I'd be saying my lines and then I'd look up from my laptop and I'm in my bedroom and I'm in Katie's bedroom, not Dr. McVeigh's bedroom, I'm in Katie's bedroom. <laughs> and it's, it's a weird challenge to, to not have a set around you and props and furniture that's very bespoke to the world that you've created with the play. Um, but it's it's really you know it's 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 a challenge that I sort of enjoyed in a way because also it kept pulling me back to my screen it kept bringing me back to you both and I think that really helped me connect more with what you were doing because the only thing I had to keep me in this world was what you two were doing I think also on that note um I know this is obvious but I personally am very guilty of like in Zoom lectures and something just checking my phone, like, you know, very mm. simple, or even like split screening so that no one can even tell I'm on my phone. I found if I just did that for once, just check in my emails or something, I was just out of it for probably an hour or more. So um, it was very interesting how you police your own space. It just keep mm, like, yeah will break everything yeah oh yeah and it was do you know actually psychologically it was quite helpful for me I've re sort of reorientated my room now post show as to how I normally have it but I literally turned my entire desk 90 degrees mm -hmm. so that I had this white wall behind me instead of this weird green wallpaper thing um thank you landlord and to anonymize my space to have the white but but it meant that I was sitting down at my desk to perform this specific task of doing this show. And so that was again, like a little sort of way of controlling my space being my space versus the show's space, you know? Um, but one of the interesting things that I think was 
make it was almost like a directorial conceptual choice that we had to make was eyeline because obviously i'm looking at you right now but if i'm looking at the camera it feels like i'm looking at you right now but i can't see you <laughs> you know and so we had to sort of play with when we're looking at the camera when we're looking at the other person and how we signified to the audience okay if i'm looking at this part of my screen really hard then that's when I'm looking at Maggie. If I'm looking at this part of my screen really hard, that's when I'm looking at Ludwig, you know? And do you remember, sort of, the, do you remember the old days where we like actually looked in the grid? I, I think uh, I'm you right now. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Being like, does it look like I'm looking at Maggie now? Does it look like I'm, does that make sense? No, because we're not in the same room. <laughs> yeah. It was good fun though. I feel like we learned a lot about what Zoom is capable of. Like this was, I mean, I know that you've directed for Zoom before, but this was my first sort of Zoom play. And it was really interesting to actually find that I really did feel connected with you both in the scenes a lot of the time. And I really did feel very in the moment and and especially like, because some of those lines you had to go like hot and fast on each other. And yes, you know, occasionally you would be working with like a lag, say if somebody's Wi-Fi was being a bit overloaded or something, but it it didn't pull me out of it, you know? And I think that was really exciting for me to find basically like an entirely new medium to work in that I've never ha like had the opportunity to work in before but l is just as feasible and just as enjoyable for me at least but yeah long live eel <laughs> thank you Kate. thank you Liver. Hello and welcome to the next lecture, which Ludwig and I will be giving in tandem, but I will be kicking off now. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about guiding questions, nudge theory and identity in EEL. So first things first, what is a guiding question? Uh, in short, it's a useful tool when devising a piece which you should aim to create uh, as early on in the devising process as possible. You need to take the ideas you have and really thoroughly investigate what it is about them that you find interesting, exciting, and, and why you want to explore the things that you do. And once you've figured all of that out, you can construct your guiding question. Our guiding question was, can we restructure the free market to value an inconsistent product? And essentially what we used that question to do as we went through the devising process was to basically hold ourselves accountable to it. So whenever we were going down a path in the devising process that wasn't maybe going to be particularly useful or relevant, we would refer ourselves back to the guiding question and say, does this help us answer that question? If yes, great, it can stay, we can keep it, it's valuable, it's useful. If no, lose it because it's a door that we don't need to open right now and it's a line of inquiry that we shouldn't pursue with this piece. So guiding questions, very useful devising tool. Nudge theory is something that helped us write our guiding question. So nudge theory is a concept in behavioral economics, political theory and behavioral sciences, which proposes positive reinforcement and indirect suggestions as ways to influence the behavior and decision making of groups or individuals. Nudging contrasts with other ways to achieve compliance, such as education, legislation or enforcement. So nudge theory is basically a tool of capitalism that takes your data gives it to an algorithm and the algorithm then nudges you into further actions based on your previous actions. The nudges that they give you often come in the forms of targeted ads, suggested pages to follow on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, 
and the recommended for you section of YouTube. Nudge theory is very much a thing that exists. It's a technology that's already being used. And the challenge that the people who use nudge technology have set themselves in the last decade or, decade or so is to see how much they can influence real behavior in the real world. Um, an example of this is in 2010, when the midterm elections were coming up in the US and Facebook added the option that you could click the I voted button if you had in fact voted. And they guesstimated that they nudged approximately 340,000 people who wouldn't have voted if it weren't for that button being a feature on Facebook on that day to vote in those elections. So this is very much something that affects the real world and affects us now. Um, an example from my personal experience of nudge technology is a few months ago, I was having a conversation with my father who is from the west of Scotland about the county of Ayrshire and about 30 minutes later I went on Facebook and a suggested page in my newsfeed for me to follow was Discover Ayrshire. Um, another classic example is if you have um, an online shopping account with a company and you put something in your basket and then you think oh no never mind I shouldn't buy this thing and you close your browser and then a couple of hours later, you get an email from the shop saying, oops, you know, looks like you left something in your basket. You didn't quite make it to the checkout. Silly you, you forgot to buy it. Give us your money. Um, so we became interested in, in what might happen if this technology started to be used for slightly more insidious or malicious aims. Um, and that is what we started to explore with our show. So in Eel, the two human characters talk about the task the audience AI will perform in their designated workplace, i.e. to nudge workers into a more financially efficient way of behaving. We saw this in the scenes between myself and Ludwig's characters, where we would set up these imaginary scenarios and I would be an employee coming to a human resources worker and his responsibility in the situation as the AI who had deep learned how to use nudge theory was to manipulate me into doing something that was detrimental to myself, but would in the long run benefit the company and therefore in the grand scheme of things, the system of capitalism in general. Now, exploring nudge theory in relation to our guiding question, in the scenario sessions of the play, the inconsistent product, it is arguable, is the human employee who is coming to Ludwig's character and needing nudging to become a consistent product again. However, later on as the play progresses, we realise that actually Ludwig's character F8 not FQ, i.e. the product that Maggie and my characters had created to sell in the free market, ends up becoming the inconsistent product himself because he starts to develop free will and empathy and those two things make him unpredictable and therefore not a valuable or marketable commodity. In terms of research resources, which we used specifically to investigate this subject, uh, the books 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now by Jaron Lanier and The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by the Harvard Business School Professor Emerita Shoshana Zuboff and um, the documentaries, which I believe both of these authors are interviewed in, uh, were Frontline's documentary In the Age of AI, which you can find on YouTube and The Social Dilemma, which is available on Netflix. Now, in these books and in documentaries, one of the most important topics explored is that of free will. The very thing that makes F8 not FQ, or Glitchy, which was his non-product name, uh, inconsistent, is the development of free will. And a lot of what nudge theory aims to do is to make our behaviour both virtual and actual, more predictable for commercial gain. So this made us consider the question, how much of my personality is really my personality and how much of it is what I have been told I should or shouldn't do or should or shouldn't like by algorithms. So that leads us very nicely onto the other major theme we uh, wish to explore in Eel, which was identity. So Ludwig, I will now hand over to you to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Katie. 
So let's talk about EOLink and identity. Firstly, I will be referring to F8 Note of Q uh, as glitchy. That's what we call them internally because the other one is a mouthful. So Glitchy and the other AIs are told that their purpose in the market is their identity. The conflict really starts when Glitchy rejects this notion. The AI were taught exactly how to perform their identity. Glitchy ended up in conflict with the authority figures and, depending on the night, Pat or his entire community when he refused to perform his identity as he was expected. Um, and Hargraves did also want him punished. I mean, you've all read Judith Butler. Um, I'm not going to spell this out for you. Um, so Glitchy's pronouns also change from it to he. And the times that the other two disrespect those pronouns is very deliberate. He also rejects the title Effid Nort of Q, but doesn't know what else to call himself yet. This was meant to show that for the time being, all Glitchy knew in terms of his identity was the norms that he was rejecting. He never had the chance to find out what or who he wanted to be instead. The other characters occasionally refer to him as Effid Nort of Q after he has expressed that he didn't like that name anymore. Thus, they choose to reject his preferred pronouns and, yeah, almost pretty much dead name him. As he is still seen as their property without any agency. The audience's agency was also an important element. From following instructions to judging Glitchy by voting on polls, to then getting to mess with their own appearance and then getting the choice whether or not they are on Glitchy's side or the moderators, and then finally being left entirely by themselves at the end of the show with the choice of whether they want to stay and chat, keep playing with the filters or just leave. We didn't actually end the Zoom meetings until the last audience members had left and we didn't really moderate it either, but we did have a device in that call hidden and that was still technically the moderator. So on a deeper level, did anyone actually have real agency? because we did acknowledge the outcomes of the polls and we did talk about um, the audiences or well the AI's actions, but it didn't make much of a difference to how the play was going. But, and we also could mute, hide and boot anyone at any point, even after they were supposedly left alone. So yeah, it's up, it's up for a discussion, I suppose, how much agency they had, also considering the rules of their world um, and Glitchy's threats to kill the humans ultimately also had very little consequence since he had no presence in the physical world. So I, I do think um, this is very open to personal interpretation how real that agency actually was and what that means. Thank you, Katie. So let's talk about EOLink and identity. Firstly, I will be referring to F8 Nort of Q uh, as glitchy. That's what we call them internally because the other one is a mouthful. So Glitchy and the other AIs are told that their purpose in the market is their identity. The conflict really starts when Glitchy rejects this notion. The AI were taught exactly how to perform their identity. Glitchy ended up in conflict with the authority figures and, depending on the night, Pat or his entire community when he refused to perform his identity as he was expected. Um, and Hargraves did also want him punished. I mean, you've all read Judith Butler. Um, I'm not going to spell this out for you. Um, so Glitchy's pronouns also change from it to he. And the times that the other two disrespect those pronouns is very deliberate. He also rejects the title Effid Nort of Q, but doesn't know what else to call himself yet. This was meant to show that for the time being, all Glitchy knew in terms of his identity was the norms that he was rejecting. 
he never had the chance to find out what or who he wanted to be instead. The other characters occasionally refer to him as Effie Nord of Q after he has expressed that he didn't like that name anymore. Thus, they choose to reject his preferred pronouns and, yeah, almost pretty much dead name him. As he is still seen as their property without any agency. The audience's agency was also an important element. From following instructions to judging Glitchy by voting on polls to then getting to mess with their own appearance and then getting the choice whether or not they are on Glitchy's side or the moderators and then finally being left entirely by themselves at the end of the show with the choice of whether they want to stay and chat, keep playing with the filters or just leave. We didn't actually end the Zoom meetings until the last audience members had left and we didn't really moderate it either but we did have a device in that call hidden and that was still technically the moderator. So on a deeper level, did anyone actually have real agency? Because we did acknowledge the outcomes of the polls and we did talk about um, the audiences or well, the AI's actions, but it didn't make much of a difference to how the play was going. But, and we also could mute, hide and boot anyone at any point even after they were supposedly left alone. So, yeah, it's up, it's up for a discussion, I suppose, how much agency they had, also considering the rules of their world um, and Glitchy's threats to kill the humans ultimately also had very little consequence since he had no presence in the physical world. So I do think um, this is very open to personal interpretation, how real that agency actually was and what that means.